Um, my name is Haley Hesseltine. I am a senior psychology major here at TCU and I will be moderating the panel today. So I'm excited to learn more through this discussion. So before we begin, um, just a couple things. We encourage you to use the chat function to ask any questions about graduate school that y'all are wondering. They can be general questions or about specific program information. Um, but we encourage the chat function over unmuting yourself just to avoid any like people talking over each other, but you can unmute yourself. Um, and we also encourage you to use speaker view if you would like that way. I know we can get distracted by each other's faces. I see a couple familiar faces and names here myself. Um, but yeah, we encourage you to use the speaker view today. So to begin, um, we're going to get to know our panelists a little bit better. So we have four panelists with us uh, with us here today. And so um, could each panelist just tell us a little bit about yourselves, your role, and if you have any relation to TCU? I can start. Um, hey everyone, my name is Joe Chapman. Uh, I am a graduate student at Ohio University in the dual degree uh, MBA and MSA program. So a sports business kind of route for anyone who's interested in that. Um, yeah, I went to Clemson undergrad. Uh, I graduated in December of 2018, uh, worked for the football program for three years while I was there, um, had a blast. Uh, I don't have any uh, connection to TCU other than that I took a visit there and applied uh, for undergrad and almost went because Chick-fil-A and In-N-Out are right next to each other there. So that was hard to turn down. Um, but yes, um, that that's that's me. Um, I'm Monica and I'm with Joe. We're in the same program. Both of us serve as recruiting coordinators for the program. Like you said, it's sports business focused. As far as my background, I went to Virginia Tech for undergrad and I was focused in the digital and marketing space. Um, and I don't have a connection to TCU, but one of our graduates from last year went to TCU undergrad. Hi, my name is Heather Hale. I serve as the Assistant Director of Admissions and Recruitment at the TCU and UNTHSC School of Medicine. So my relationship with TCU is I work there and I'm just down the campus at the School of Medicine. Howdy everyone, my name is Natalia Cashin and I am a proud 2010 grad of TCU, go Frogs. Um, I am now the admissions advisor at Texas A&M School of Law where I am also a graduate um, from there from 2014. And we are just down the road from TCU so we love seeing TCU grads uh, come on down and join us at the law school. Awesome. Thanks everyone for introducing yourselves. So I'm going to kick it off with a few questions and um, give y'all more time to think. Um, so again, please put any and all questions in the chat and they will definitely be answered today. So first off, thinking about admissions, this is something I've wondered myself as I'm currently looking at graduate programs, but what is the relative importance of admissions test scores, undergraduate grades, recommendations, statements on applications, experiences, and other requirements y'all may have, and how they kind of weigh out? So I'll get started. Um, medical school, that's all very specific. So for our program, we look at your combined GPA, so any coursework that you've taken at a community college, undergraduate, graduate, post bac et cetera. And then of course, we look at your MCAT score, which for our program needs to be in the 40th percentile. And we do require letters of recommendation, but for us, we're looking for individuals who can write letters that speak to your personal and professional readiness for medical school. So that doesn't necessarily mean just a basic science faculty member. And then, of course, we'd like to see all the experiences that you've done within your undergraduate career from volunteerism, leadership, um, have you had any clinical experience, and then any other research or presentations that you've done. So for medical school, it's quite specific. I'm going to follow up on that because I think um, the last thing that Heather said is, is so important because each, um, you know, when I was applying to law school, I didn't realize how much information schools have to publish about their medians and about their, you know, all of their statistics and everything that they're offering for students. So as your, my suggestion would be, as you're looking at different schools, you might want to set up like an Excel and you might want to look at all the schools. For law schools, we all have to report um, to the ABA and we have what's called a 509 report. So you can search for every law school and look at the 509 report and it will tell you all of our incoming medians, but also our range of acceptability. So that's going to be, you know, from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. Um, and then we also have on our website, 
an hour and a half long video that we um, taped for you all to go over you know, what we're looking for in the application. It's kind of a lengthy application, so there are a lot of different things, um, specific things that we're looking for. So I would encourage you as you're, as you're starting to explore to reach out to the individual offices. Most of us um, in, in admissions are willing to take on individual appointments and um, meet with you and talk to you about those specifics. So um, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, um, for us, for a sports business um, graduate in general, you want to look at the program specifically. So we have an MBA and an MSA program, but some schools will just have the MSA and might be more focused on your GA. So you're working the whole time while you're there, um, which that's not necessarily how it is for us. When it comes to test scores, we're specifically waiving it and are going to do that um, for the foreseeable future, just with COVID going on and resources and time are different for people. So we're not going to require test scores. Um, and then for us, it's a pretty simple application, um, three letters of rec and a personal statement. We look at everything pretty equally, really look at your experience. And that personal statement is something that we look at. Yeah, I think also to tack on uh, with that, you know, especially for like letters of recommendation, um, you know, for those who are interested in going into grad school, I would definitely, um, you know, recommend get someone who actually knows you. Um, so like for me, when I was at Clemson, um, you know, Dabo Sweeney, who's a head coach there, he, you know, has a thing where he can write a letter of recommendation uh, to any student worker who comes to the program. Um, but I spoke to the guy maybe three times in my three years there. So like, I knew that, you know, it, it'd be a big name, but it wouldn't necessarily be a quality letter of rec. It would probably just be kind of like a copy paste that he does for all other students. So um, I think it's, you know, really important that you can get someone who um, can talk to you specific or like talk about you specifically um, and has, you know, um, been around you a lot to know you well enough to do that. Um, and then also, you know, for our program, you know, there's, there's 50 people um, between the two classes who are here at a time. So, you know, like when you get to the interview stage um, after that, you know, we're just kind of looking for people that you know, we enjoy being around, you know, who kind of fit, you know, the culture here and um, the vibe and stuff like that. So, um, you know, just, just being yourself at that point and just, um, you know, kind of, you know, taking it one step at a time from there, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of my recommendations. Yeah, these are all some great points. And um, actually kind of going off of that, um, something that really I haven't seen talked about too much is how to go about asking for a re letter of recommendation. So should we bring uh, materials to potential um, writers of letter recommendations? How do we go about asking for one? Yeah, um, I can kind of follow that up too. Um, you know, it, it kind of varies um, for different people. I mean, for me, I the way I kind of went about it was um, ask a professor who I had, who I was super close with, um, a former boss, or you know, at the at the time, my boss, um, who's now a former boss. But um, and then you know, so for us, we have three, and I did you know one of each of those, and then for the third, um, I did a family friend who happened to be like in the industry um, and. Uh, kind of could speak to myself on a personal level. So you have work, um, you know, you have work, uh, academics, and then, you know, just like you as a person, um, you know, it, it'll depend. Uh, some people may want you to write the letter and they sign their name on it. Um, and some other people will just go ahead and write it. Um, so, you know, as far as like asking them, just like, as long as you have a good relationship with them, obviously, um, you know, it should be fairly seamless just in, you know, I, professors love to do that and help out their kids you know they're there to teach them and serve them so um it's you know i, I feel like it's a fairly uh, seamless kind of stress-free process or at least from my experience it's also beneficial to share your resume with your letter writer that way they can cite specific instances that have happened and that way it's all congruent throughout your application along with your letters so for us, um, the application cycle is really competitive and um, we do rolling admissions. And so um, we open September 1st and close May, May 31st, but really we make the bulk of our decisions so that students can make their seed deposits by April 1. And so, you know, making sure that you email your professor or your supervisor or whoever it is that you, that you want to get this letter of recommendation from, set up an appointment, talk to them about, you know, why do you want to go to law school, what law schools you're applying to, um, kind of what you would think that you would want them to write about, presenting that resume, giving them, you know, all of the information that they need to be able to write your letter of recommendation tailored to the law schools that you're applying to, and then also a timeline and a, and a deadline, because 
Um, a lot of times we have students that are, are wanting to be reviewed by specific deadlines that we have internally, um, but they're waiting on those, on those letters of rec. And so it's really important to be able to give um, your recommender all of that information so that they can write you your best letter and then also to get it in timely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's something that I never knew, like asking for recommendation letters. Is it helpful to give the materials up front, such as like your resume or like due dates for applications? So I think definitely knowing that beforehand can really put you ahead. Um, so another question that I thought was interesting and everyone else was probably interested in is what are some common mistakes you see students making during their college application process? I think it's beneficial to do your pre-work on all the institutions that you're applying to. Um, there are so many options and if they don't really fit your needs or what you're hoping to achieve by going to not only medical school, but any type of graduate school to just see if you align with their mission, vision and values as opposed to just throwing a lot of applications somewhere. And also the application process can be quite costly. So making sure that you do meet the requirements before you do pay for an application for a place that you may not even be able to enroll in. So I think it's really important to, again, Excel is your friend throughout all of this to build a spreadsheet of where you can apply, where it fits your needs, fits your, um, how much you plan to spend on graduate and professional school. So that's a great place to start. Um, I think for us uh, with sports business, a lot of people will come in and just say, I love sports. I'm a fan of sports. And um, yeah, that's why I want to come into this program. Uh, for us, you know, it, it's very similar to what Heather said and that, you know, you, you need to understand like uh, what the values are the, um, of the program, respective program you're applying for, um, kind of like what route you want to take, uh, you know, for us, you know, loving the business side of sports, not just um, sports in general, I think is obviously really important. I um, mean, you don't necessarily like know what path you need to, you want to go down in the sports industry, but, um, you know, obviously doing your research uh, beforehand, kind of having an understanding of um, what, you know, paths there are and where you could potentially see yourself fit, um, I think, you know, is, is obviously kind of an important thing for us. And sometimes people don't necessarily put that time or research or effort into going in. Um, I would say also staying on top of like deadlines and making sure you actually know all of the information that you need for an application because we were looking at applications and our deadline for the first wave is October 31st and we have great candidates who have everything in but they're missing one thing and they might not be able to get it in by Friday and that pushes them back for to a whole nother wave of, applica of applications. Um, so like talking to someone in admission so just you know all of the requirements that you actually need to make sure you're not missing something when that date comes up and you have to get pushed back. I was going to speak to the personal statement. I think um, for us that's one of the, the areas that a um, is probably the hardest because it's such a we have a broad statement. A lot of personal statements are kind of really broad prompts, um, mostly because we want to allow students to be able to tell us about their experiences and people are you know unique and have their different experiences. And so we don't you know we don't want to make it too narrow. Um, but I think that results in really general personal statements. Um, two, I also think that there is a lot of really bad information um, on Reddit. And I don't know why students love to get on Reddit, um, but I will tell you that the best place to find out what I wanna see in your personal statement, the person who is processing it and reviewing it is to ask me or to come to one of our information sessions or do something like this rather than trust, you know, whatever person is on Reddit telling you what you need to say in your personal statement. Um, so for, for all of you to know, what we're looking for in a personal statement is number one, what I think anybody's looking for any, in any written work product is, you know, following instructions about how long it needs to be, spacing, you know, any of the formatting things. It may seem silly, but at least for us in, in law school, how you format um, a brief for a judge matters, whether the judge is going to read it or not, and whether you're going to be able to um, get your client what they need. Um, so following instructions is really important. And um, two, I think that a lot of students want to write about their whole life experience in a personal statement. And our personal statement is two pages. It's just not possible or feasible. So my recommendation is always to spend some time drafting out, you know, things that you think are important about yourself as it relates to your application. So for us it would be maybe why you want to go to law school or, 
or you know why you want to pursue this career. Um, and then narrow it down to one thing. I know it seems scary to write about one specific thing in a personal statement because you feel like you're going to um, maybe not be able to give us a whole view of who you are, but that's what the rest of your application is for. Um, and writing that very concise personal statement is actually more effective. We will actually feel like we know you a little bit better if you were able to write more specifically. So I would definitely spend some time finding out from your different um, programs what they're looking for in their personal statement um, and try to tailor it to that institution um, because that that's probably the only part of your application that really comes from you um, with your voice. And it's really important, at least for, for our process, to get to know you. I think also on the topic of personal statements, I think it, you know, it gives you um, the freedom to uh, kind of address any red flags you might have on your uh, resume or transcript. So, you know, for instance, maybe like first semester junior year, um, you didn't have the grades that you had um, in other semesters and maybe you had an injury or, you know, some, you know, something happened that caused uh, that to happen to you. And that's obviously like a place where you can talk about that and kind of inform the reader um, so that they're you know, more understanding of uh, your situation as a whole um, and stuff like that. It's also great to have multiple sets of eyes look over your personal statement. They may catch something or suggest something. So a friend, a colleague, an instructor, someone in the writing center at your institution, definitely don't just do it on your own when you have resources available to you. Thanks for that information. Yeah, I think personal statements are so important. And something that I've been horrible about is just talking about myself and figuring out the right ways to do it and how to be concise with it. Because I'm a very wordy person, so it's hard to fit it into like 600 word limit. But yeah, definitely. Thank you for the information. Something else that was interesting that was brought up was the cost of applying to graduate school, the cost of taking tests. And for a lot of people, it can rack up really quick on how much you're going to spend. So are there options for like fee waivers, um, test discounts, those sorts of things when applying? So for medical school, um, we use AMCAS, which is the national application system, and they offer a fee waiver through there. You have to apply for it through AMCAS. And then if you're awarded the fee waiver for a primary application, we then honor that for the secondary application as well. So I think it varies depending on the application system. Yeah, so for, for law school, there, there are quite a few fees. Um, you're gonna sign up on LSAC. Um, if you take the LSAT or the GRE, which we, we accept either, you're gonna pay for those. And then you have like a CAS report fee and then a CAS um, credential fee. And so there are lots of fees. Um, LSAC has a program where you can apply through them um, and, and get some waivers that way. We have waived the application fee for, for this following cycle. Um, and you can also submit a request um, to be reviewed to waive your CAS um, report fee. Um, so, so it kind of depends. It, it can be either through us, um, through our program or through LSAC. Um, I know when I, we are waiving it for our specific programs, but if you're looking at other programs, I know when I did it through um, my FAFSA, I was awarded um, a waiver for the GRE. Um, and then for the application fee, if you fit certain qualifications, um, sometimes we'll waive that fee, but that you have to reach out to the director of the program and figure it out from there. Yeah, thanks for the information. I know when I was looking at GRE test scores, I think you can get like a 50% discount as well if you're gonna take the GRE for your program. So, and they're definitely really nice about giving that out. So definitely check that out. I'm sure like with other tests that they have a similar process. But um, so another thing that um, I've been thinking of is, um, so I've had a lot of interest throughout my college career. I'm studying psychology. I'm interested in higher education, but I've also been interested in business. I've been interested in chemistry, all these different things. So do y'all require that your that a bachelor's degree is related to the field of study that you're pursuing in graduate school? Or is this something like, let's say I'm studying psychology, but I wanna go off and be a cardiologist one day, it would be okay to apply. Yeah, so for our program, um, we don't even require a bachelor's degree to apply. You just need 90 credit hours from an institution in the United States, as well as our required prerequisite courses. And actually in our class that just began in July, 
um, out of 60, we had over 32 under, or excuse me, undergraduate areas of study represented. So they ranged from biochemistry, math, biology to foreign language, dance, music performance. So for us, particularly at our medical school, we do not require that you have a science related degree to apply. So that's um, the same for us at the law school. We don't have a, a required or preferred um, undergraduate degree. I think probably one of the, the worst myths um, when it comes to law school applications that you have to have a political science degree. I think like 90% of political science degree majors <laughs> are going into law school. Um, so we just tell students what is really important is your undergraduate GPA. And so pick a degree that you're gonna enjoy, that you're happy with, that you could potentially get a job um, with when you graduate if you decide not to go to law school. Um, because if you're a poli sci major like I was and you don't wanna go to law school, there's like two choices. You could be like a history teacher um, or go on a campaign. And so I should have done that business degree that my dad talked about. Um, but, but realistically, think about a, a career in, in, you know, in a degree that you're gonna, you're gonna find useful whether you or not you go to grad school, um, at least in, in our sense, um, and that you're gonna do well in. And that's what we can see when we're looking at your transcripts and the report that um, LSAC creates for us is we're able to see how well you did with your major at your school. And so we're just looking to see that you were successful in your program. Yeah, for us, um, it does not matter what major you were. We have computer science, psychology, journalism. Um, what they really look at is kind of at your transcript to see if we think that you can um, fare in the business side of things. Like I was a journalism major, took a few math courses that didn't have a lot of grades in math. Um, so that was, we have to take finance and accounting and all that um, for the MBA. But we do offer, so if you don't have that experience, um, like if you were a different major, we do offer like a math course that you would take before you actually start doing the MBA. So that's kind of a way to get around that if you do lack in that part. Oh, I did wanna jump in really quickly because I always say this and I forget. If you are interested in um, patent law, specifically at the law school, you do have to have um, a STEM major to be able to sit for the patent bar. So that's a, you know, a very narrow area of law, um, but that is one where they are looking for that particular, and it's not, you don't have to necessarily graduate with the STEM degree, but you have to have a certain number of credit hours in STEM courses to be able to sit for the patent bar. I know that's kind of narrow, but just in case. And kind of going off of that, there was just a question in the chat. Um, it says, do law schools adjust GPAs based on majors, such as STEM degree GPA possibly being a little lower than a business degree GPA? Right, so we do a holistic review, which means that we are looking, like I said, um, you know, that really expensive fee that you pay for your, your CAS um, explanation from LSAC is going to give us that breakdown of, of how well you did and, and how difficult your major was and, and things like that. So there is, there is a consideration when we're looking at different majors, but, um, but you know, it's not like, oh, okay, if you are a chem major and you have a 2.9, um, we're not gonna be concerned about the 2.9. Like we might still have questions about why it's a 2.9, but, but because we can see all of those details, we are able to take all this, those things into, into consideration um, and kind of view it holistically. Awesome. So kind of um, thinking of the idea of kind of like preferences, um, do graduate programs prefer applicants immediately out of undergraduate programs or do they prefer applicants with a bit of work experience or is there a preference that exists? For our program um, specifically, I we don't. Um, I would say, you know, 60% of us are straight out of undergrad. Um, and, you know, I mean, there are definitely MBA programs that are out there that say, you know, we uh, require five years of experience before coming back. Um, you know, for, for myself personally, I figured that if I didn't go to graduate school straight out of undergrad, that I probably wasn't going to take the time to go back and do it. Um, just personal preference. But, um, you know, it, that's definitely like something to research when you're looking at your different grad uh, school programs, um, you know, because it, it varies a lot. Um, so, but for us specifically, no, we don't look at it. We have no preference either at the medical school. And we have a very unique blend of students who have come straight from undergraduate, some who have entered into a post back or master's program following um, undergraduate and then go to medical school. And then we have some who have done a complete change in career. Um, our age range for our classes are 22 to 40. 
So we have individuals from all walks of life, so we have no preference. Same as everybody else, no preference. Our average age is 24. So I would say that majority of our students do come straight from undergrad into law school. But also, um, I think some of our, our highest achieving um, students have been non-traditional students. So, so my recommendation would just be, which, you know, whichever one you are, um, if you're traditional and you're, you're going to graduate and you're not sure what you want to do, maybe don't just jump into law school. Maybe take some time to, to work, to figure it out, to study for the LSAT. That's a great reason to take some time off, um, get some professional experience. There's obviously a great benefit um, to coming into law school, knowing how to manage your time. Um, and as much as you may think you learn how to manage your time in undergrad, it's a little bit different when you're working um, a full-time job. Um, but if you are non-traditional, then I would just say making sure that you're able to highlight those things on your resume um, to show them as, as strengths um, and to kind of explain what you've been doing since you, you've graduated. Yeah, thank you. all um, We have a couple questions in the chat about law school. Um, if anything resonates with the other panelists, though, y'all can chime in as well. So the first one is, I heard that law schools accept the GRE. Would you have to score exceptionally high on the GRE to outweigh not taking the LSAT? So yes, there are, um, I think there's now like over 60 law schools that accept nationally that accept the GRE. In Texas, I think there's just still three. I think it's us, UT, and SMU. Um, we, we weigh the LSAT and the GRE the same, so we don't have a preference over LSAT or GRE. Um, but I will say that for us right now, um, our LSAT median was a 160 for the last class, and our GRE medians are kind of in the 80 to 85th percentile. So if you, you know, I, I do think that probably is categorized as exceptionally high for both of those. So whichever, whichever one you take, um, you need to study and make sure you, you do um, really well. Yeah, thank you. And the second question was, does course history matter at all to law schools? In other words, are applicants with undergraduate experience in certain law classes preferred over those with no experience in these kinds of subjects? So, so no, um, I do think that it can be helpful to you as the applicant to take some courses like logic courses or philosophy courses or writing courses, just to strengthen those skills. Um, it, it's a good way to prepare for the LSAT. The LSAT has a section called logic games, which is everybody's like bane of their existence. And so some logic practice before you do that is kind of um, a good idea. But we, we definitely, um, like for example, somebody who's even been a paralegal for several years before they go into law school, um, they're still not going to have all of the skills that you're gonna need to be a lawyer. That's why they're going to law school. And so we're, there isn't, I don't think an advantage um, to, to taking any of those specific courses like for your law school coursework or for admissions purposes, just maybe um, to prepare you for um, taking the LSAT. Yeah, thank you. So another question um, that I think would be helpful with the application process is what are some ways past applicants have really stood out to you? For us, we see a lot of your personality through our secondary application. Um, the primary application is very standard for anyone applying to medical school through the national application system. So we get the same types of data from that. But our secondary application is very specific to our program. And we capture data through an audio-based recording question or multiple questions. So you're asked a question in a timed environment and then you simply record your voice answering the question. And so we get a lot of really interesting, unique and funny responses from that where we feel like your personality is shining through. And I think for us, those really stand out to our admissions committee when they can hear you telling us about why you wanna become a physician or why you believe our school is the best fit for you. So that's my favorite part. And that's where we really hear when we get to see who you are as a person. I know for us, um, so we'll reach out to a lot of people or a lot of people will reach out to us and they'll speak to Joe and I. Um, and usually like in the past, they would do phone calls, but with um, we've been doing a lot of Zoom calls and those have been really effective. So when we're looking at applicants, we're taking into account the people that have reached out to us and have talked to us because being able to talk to them, we get to see a little bit of their personality. Um, so when we're reading the personal statements and looking at everything, it all makes more sense. So really the people that have put in effort um, and they understand the program better as well. And so when you're reading that personal statement and they're talking about what they can bring to the program and everything, you can tell that they understand um, what the culture is and all of that a lot better because they put in the effort to reach out and talk to us. 
have anything to add because I think both of those things were were the same for us. I think um, making those those you know those in person, which used to be in person, right when you could tour, but just reaching out to those schools and and we put on a lot of events and you can sign up for all those events. So if we can see your name often, it's a great way to stay top of mind and it's a good rule for for networking in in general um, to learn that the more that you can get in front of people, even if it's via Zoom, um, you're gonna you're gonna go a long way with them. Yeah, thank y'all. Um, so a common theme I kind of see here is just being able to show your personality through your application. And so if there isn't an interview process or any sort of way to really express yourself verbally throughout the application process, what are some ways you can really show your personality through, let's say, your writing or your application online? For me, I mean, like, I think it kind of goes back to what Monica said, where it's like, you know, actually, you know, having the initiative and reaching out to like recruiters or professors and just kind of like expressing interest because, you know, at the end of the day, like those are going to be the people who are sitting in the rooms um, and, you know, may go to bat for you, um, you know, so like that's kind of that's not like application related, but like if there is not an interview process, then, you know, there's there's that as well, um, you know, like in, in, in an application, I, I, I do think it uh comes down like you know i think the place where you show the most personality is in your personal statement um so it doesn't necessarily like have to be that cookie cutter response um you know where um you, you know it's just kind of like the same old thing you know kind of being creative um you know the first paragraph usually is the most important that's kind of what you know opens our eyes the most um and so like being creative kind of you know um, for lack of a better term dropping the hammer you know just kind of like boom, here, here we are um, type thing, I, th I think, you know, is a, is a really good place to kind of like show that personality for sure. Um, we don't really publish this because they're not, they're not required parts of the application, but we do have um, the opportunity for students to submit addendums. And one of the ones that we accept is a Y Texas a and and the other one is a diversity addendum. So sometimes, um, and, and you know, part of us not publishing it also is that the students that reach out to us and talk to us, we always mention these addendums. And so um, kind of a, a way to stand out and show a little bit more of you than just what's required um, is to know about those addendums and to be able to add them to your application. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I would never think to ask about the addendums. It, it all just goes back, like, you know, use your resources, like, don't be afraid to ask those questions. So definitely, thank you. Um, I have another question in the chat that has some interest for multiple people. Um, so this person says, I'm a geology major and I'm working on my grad school applications. Are, do you have any advice on how to ask a professor to be your thesis supervisor? The professor would, of course, be doing research that you're interested in. So that um, we actually have a four year required research project for our medical school students. And we always encourage them that if they've done research at the undergraduate level and they wanna bring that individual over to continue to do that project with them, they're more than able to do it. And I think just asking them, you know, if, especially if they're the one who have taught you and led you to this and it's really your passion and you wanna continue studying it to just ask them. And for us at the School of Medicine, They'll be onboarded as um, a pseudo faculty member throughout your four years with us to help assist with that research. So I think most faculty members would jump at a chance to help do some research with one of their former students and see them, you know, grow in their career. I think this also kind of goes back to the same thing for, for letters of recommendation. I think anytime you're going to ask anybody to give, um, you know, their time to you, um, you're going to probably get the best response if you are organized, if you're providing them with all the information they need to make their decision. Um, I just think it's a um, kind of one of those tenets of professionalism and respect of saying, you know, I value the work that you're doing and I think that you would be a great supervisor. This is, you know, what I would expect to do for you. You know, you kind of just want to be able to lay all of that out and then be able to follow through with, with your end of the bargain. I think most people that go into higher education, we don't go in it for the money. We go into it for um, relationships with students and assisting students. Um, but I will tell you that, um, at least from my perspective, anytime I'm mentoring students, if my students aren't on time, if they're not putting in their effort, if they're not respectful, I mean, I, you know, I definitely don't want to do it then. So being respectful and, and being responsible, I think, is your, your best approach. 
Sure, thank you. And I think that also goes back to another great point of just doing your research beforehand. I know when I've looked at grad schools, I've looked at professors who do certain types of research and what would be interesting to me and what would not. So don't be afraid to reach out again and just, you know, say, hey, like, I think your research is pretty cool. I read this paper, blah, blah, blah. You know, as a psychology major, I read so many papers. So it's something that I enjoy doing. But yeah, so thinking about like pro your specific programs and what are some applied experiences that are included in your programs? Classroom knowledge is really important, but I know a lot of people like me love to be hands-on with things. So what are some opportunities for that? Um, I can start with that. <clears throat> for, for us, you know, experiential opportunities are, uh, you know, one of the biggest things as part of our program, you know, each year you get a graduate assistantship position um, in the first year it's in the college of business and the second year it's in athletics. Um, so whether that be compliance, development, fundraising facilities, you know, marketing, a bunch of different things uh, of that nature, you can work with teams. Um, but also, you know, our program's been around uh, since the sixties and, you know, we take about 25 a class. And so um, with that being said, there's a lot of alumni who are out there in the sports industry who um, work pretty big time events. Um, and, you know, whenever they need event interns, we're kind of the first place that they turn. So um, every year we'll send a couple of people to the Super Bowl. Um, every year we'll send them to Las Vegas Motor Speedway because um, there's two NASCAR races out there, the National Rodeo Finals, uh, Final Four. Uh, it's kind of like a you name it. Uh, we kind of will we'll send people there. Um, so I think that that's like one of the coolest parts about our program. Um, Monica had um, a really cool opportunity that uh, I'll let her touch on, but um, you know, there, there it's, it's pretty cool uh, for our program specifically, kind of the external opportunities that uh, we get um, outside of the classroom. Yeah, we have a lot of alum who bring different opportunities. Um, and there's like he mentioned a bunch of ones that we do every year and then random ones will just come up. So for the NBA All-Star Game, um, three people in my program were reached out to to work a TikTok activation. It was like the week before they like just get to Chicago, like, well, how's you pay you all that stuff. So things like that will come up. We also have a lot of trips. Um, the biggest one is our international trip. So to finish out our MBA, we go to Europe for two weeks and we do consulting over there. Um, so we were supposed to go to Hungary and Italy. We didn't because of COVID, but that's what we do every year. You do a domestic trip before that. And then we do um, a North Carolina trip. And then we do for our two classes, we work with companies each semester in your MSA year and you go and present to them in person. Um, and they take you to games and all that depending on which company or organization you're with. So there are a lot of opportunities for that. Our program is a little different than some other medical school models. Whereas our students get to interact with patients during their first year of medical school. And then they enter into their clerkship model in year two. So um, our inaugural class last week just started and they're on their clerkship rotation. So really within 18 months, you're out really seeing patients and you're outside of the classroom more often than you're in the classroom. So very hands-on and everything we do is um, team-based and problem-based learning. So we don't have lecture halls. You're not talked at for eight hours a day. It's um, a lot of adult learners. So you do some pre-work at home and then you come to class ready to learn and very hands-on and interactive. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it definitely is students are looking at programs that you should be asking for specific examples of, of how that is um, managed because you, I think no matter what practice area or profession you're going into, hands-on learning is, is gonna be, you know, what's valuable to employers. And so for us, um, you know, we have a six hour requirement for all law schools to do experiential learning. Um, but we start in the first year with our professional identity program um, encouraging students to, um, basically follow a checklist where you're going to, you know, get a mentor and join a networking um, association, which we have, what they're called bar associations, and you're going to um, do a clinic, you're going to be going into court, you're going to get your third year bar card. Um, so, you know, beyond just your traditional internships and externships, there are a lot of things that are created into the curriculum that are going to allow you to get that practice. Um, and especially, I think, in any of these programs where you're you spent you know four years in college and then for us it's three years in law school um you need to be able to graduate um, and have some of that hands-on experience and and not learn it on the job basically yeah thanks for that information um so we have time for a couple more questions and so one question or one thing that we love at tcu is making our course schedule every semester we're about to get to choose our classes so i'm excited so Thinking of graduate programs, um, how much freedom do students have in choosing their courses? So 
so medical school during um, almost all of it, it's preset for you. But when you enter into your third and fourth years, you have options for electives and selectives. And we kind of call these your audition rotations where you get to travel around the state and the country to see where you would like to practice for your residency after you graduate. So there's flexibility there for um, global health opportunities as well as subspecialties. So you, you learn the required seven disciplines of medical education, but if you're interested in orthopedics, plastic surgery, some of those other um, specialties, you have the opportunity to build that into your schedule during those years. Um, for us, it's all set, but in your MSA year, you'll do um, six credits of practicum. So you can do an independent study. You can do research with a professor, um, research with an organization. You can work with a sports team. Um, so that's kind of your time to do something tailored more to what you want to do and on your own. For law school, your first year, um, if you're in the full-time program, is set for you. They're called lockstep courses. And then you have a couple of required courses that you have to complete in your second and third year. But the rest of the time, you're able to select your own coursework. And so um, you know, everyone's going to graduate with a general JD, but there is an option. We have 11 concentrations. So if you know you want to do a specific practice area, you can pick those types of classes. It's similar to a major, but um, you don't you don't have to graduate with one and employers aren't expecting you to graduate with one so it's really just more of an advantage for you to keep track of the classes that you want to take for a, a specific practice area yeah thank y'all and so for our last question this is something that i know i've wondered and a lot of people do so how competitive are your programs and how many graduates programs should i apply to when looking around Um, for us, our program is pretty competitive in the sports administration kind of world. Um, you know, we, we are the oldest program and have been, you know, consistently ranked number one or number two in the country, in the world, uh, for it. So, um, you know, it, it, it is definitely like a competitive structure there. Um, when I went through this process, I applied to two schools, but I would say like a, a fair ballpark number is, you know, at least for kind of our, um, field would probably be like, you know, three or four. Um, but, you know, it, it's obviously like totally up to you what you're most comfortable with. Um, so um, that's kind of a number that I usually throw out there, but, you know, it, it obviously differs for everybody. Um, the average applicant to medical school applies to 15 to 16 schools. So quite a few. And depending on where you're applying, the class sizes can vary. Um, we are a new program, but our class size is only 60 and will remain 60. So it does tend to be a bit more competitive just since we have such a limited amount of seats. And the reason we do is because we do offer those clinical experiences much earlier in your career. So we have to have a lot of buy-in from local physicians to be the preceptors. Um, so for us, we receive about 3,000 applications each cycle. Um, we admit somewhere between 500 to 600 students and then we yield. So our, our actual class is about 160 to 180 students. So we're, we're always, between a 22 to 25% selectivity rate. Um, so pretty competitive. Um, the school has risen in the ranks recently. We just got ranked 60. We were unranked when we were Texas Wesleyan. So there's, I think, additional just kind of a interest in the school right now. Um, I will say that um, it's important, I think, to, to spend time researching all your institutions, all those ranges of, of acceptability, knowing, you know, being fairly honest with yourself about where you fit in those categories, right? In your median GPAs, LSAT, GREs, um, and then apply, you know, based on that, apply to some, you know, schools that you think maybe you'll never get into, but apply anyways, because if we do holistic review, you know, there's always outliers. Um, apply to the ones where you know you meet those ranges and then apply to some safety schools where you know, you know, kind of do that, that breadth of experience, um, but then really be thoughtful about where you would actually want to go because all of those things like we mentioned there's cost right and that and it adds up um but i can't tell you how many times students say like you're our, you're my number one choice and i'm only applying to you and i say like well your goal really shouldn't be to go to texas a&m school of law your goal should be to go to a law school graduate pass the bar become a lawyer um and how you get there can be a lot of different ways um and so it's it's not a great thing when that one person that applied to that one school doesn't get in because now what right um, if you had applied to other schools, you could go there and love it and be on your way for three years, or you could 
go there and then transfer to our school, you give yourself more options if you've applied more places, at least in the law school setting. Um, so I would definitely think about um, kind of doing all that research and then creating your, your opportunities that way. Yeah, following up that I would definitely recommend to not put all your eggs in one basket. I know it's like really cliche to say, but you know, um, whether that be emotionally or, you know, just with the number of applications that you're putting out there. I remember coming out of undergrad, um, you know, my dream school was North Carolina. That was, uh, you know, where I wanted to go um, and didn't get in, uh, went to Clemson and, you know, had the time of my life and the years I was there working for the football program um, were obviously like really successful and really cool. So, um, you know, you, you never know what's out there, um, you know, and you know, once you get kind of in it and, you know, immersed in it, then you could realize that that's the perfect spot for you. Um, and so I, you know, I just, I always tell people like not to put all their eggs in one basket um, and just kind of be open to different opportunities. Um, Cause you know, there's, there's a lot of really cool things out there. Yeah, thank you all so much for that information. I, I think it's good advice to definitely apply to multiple places and, um, you know, just be prepared for anything. Everything works out for a reason. So, um, yeah, that is all the time we have. You'll know if y'all have any other questions about graduate school, you're always welcome to reach out to admissions advisors. They will answer everything and anything for you. That's what they're there for. Um, but I also just wanna take the time to thank our panelists today. I definitely learned so much from y'all about graduate school applications that I'll use as I'm finishing up mine. I'm sure everyone else learned something today. So thank y'all for taking the time and thanks for the students for coming and asking questions. Um, we enjoyed seeing y'all here. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.